So my name is Jesse Martinez. I am one of the co-founders for Latino Startup Alliance. And we are honored to have our panelists today to talk about uh, this talk tech with the, with the media. And let's start with uh, some introductions. So we'll start with uh, Jose. My name is Jose Vargas Ulloa. Most people know me across the country as the Latino Cyber Guy on English, Spanish language, social media, and television. Um, I have 25 years of experience of still not knowing where it's going or what it's going, but having fun doing it. And I guess that's the whole process of what we're going to try to do, or what I'm going to try to do, is give you some insights, some tips, some tricks of what, what, how, and where it's going so that you have uh, immediate access to, to the marketplace. Because sometimes you get lost in the theory, and I don't want to talk about theory. I really want to talk about what's, happened, what's worked for me and how it can work for you. Great. Thank you. Mary? My name is Mary Aviles. Uh, I'm a journalist originally from Venezuela. I'm the co-publisher of Tech Boom, a Latino text and entrepreneurship website, and most recently also a Knight Fellow at Stanford University. So I've been living in Silicon Valley and uh, being involved in this uh, innovation and entrepreneurial culture. I just, you know, had a lot of uh, inside information, and, and I was listening to all these wonderful stories that Latinos are making in the valley, and I just feel the need to tell those stories. Thank you. Well, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Mr. Alberto Saldamando. I'm the uh, founder and editor of, of, of uh, ElMundoTech.com. I've been writing for Intermedia, first as a, as a freelance for um, La Prensa Orlando since 2006 to 2008. And then it was in 2008 when I started uh, with my own blog, because I was thinking back then, what are the news, las noticias, about technology in Espanol? And back then I was thinking, okay, I know someone, some people are Latinos but born here. So I was thinking, hmm, I, why don't I do the news in both languages? So I started doing that, and because since I was a kid, I loved Japanese animation, video games. And it's more actually my advantage, because when I was working in the education field, it got to be like one tool for me to get closer to the students when it comes to teaching. Uh, so right now, I'm, let's see, I've been doing, I've been invited by NASA in a couple of occasions for NASA social, and that's something that I would love to bring to my website as well, more news about in both languages, about space, uh, about the uh, military technology as well, and of course I want to continue doing the news we hear about the uh, the internet or the uh, applications, uh, smartphone applications, and what about video games and other things. Um, Giovanni Rodriguez, and uh, I'm not a journalist. <laughs> what I am is uh, is a business person, entrepreneur, and a blogger. Um, and I blog for Forbes, uh, where I actually changed my beat along the way. They didn't know I was going to do this. I just started writing about Hispanics. And I uh, took a very serious interest in Hispanic entrepreneurship. And I've been following a couple of trends. Uh, one is uh, entrepreneurship in Silicon Valley. Uh, the other is entrepreneurship uh, with companies that are looking to help access new markets and new ideas. Uh, sometimes a new market will be, how do you actually help facilitate commerce between Latin America and the US. Um, in addition to those two gigs, you know, blogging for Forbes and, and oh, actually, I forgot to mention, I have a social uh, consulting company, it's more on the social movement side, not, not social media. Uh, also started a tech company. So um, one way to think about me is that I'm an entrepreneur that writes about entrepreneurs. Great, thank you. And, and I think, Giovanni, with, with that, you know, talking about you know, some of the areas that you're covering and I think for the, the purposes of this panel, uh, how are you seeing Latinos emerge in this tech and entrepreneurial space? Well, it's really interesting. Um, I wrote an article maybe two years ago where I noted that there were all these groups that I thought used to compete. Suddenly, they're starting to collaborate. And I think either they were forced to collaborate or they just saw an opportunity to do things differently. And I can't remember, at this one I might have called the, the, the Latinos of Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I just listed all these organizations. Some of them were new, some of them, some of them were young. Uh, but the fact is that if you're going to be active in an innovation market, you absolutely have to collaborate because the best ideas are ideas that get tested. 
in real marketplaces with real human beings. And uh, Jesse and I have talked about this before. Actually, this has been difficult for Hispanics. We're not the most trusting culture. <laughs> We're not the most open culture. And it's actually very good to just you know look at that challenge head on. There's some cultures, by the way, that we can really learn from. If you look at the Indian entrepreneur community in Silicon Valley, there's a huge event called TIE, T-I-E. It used to stand for the Indus Entrepreneurs, but it became so popular with other ethnic groups they decided, no, let's just name it Thai, simply Thai. The Indians can teach the Hispanics a lot. That's something we can talk about in an entire session. Yeah, no, that, that's a yeah. great uh, yeah. example. And, yeah. and that organization is called Thai.org, and it probably started about mm -hmm. over 30 years ago. And just a great um, community coming together to support one another without expecting anything in return. So many years later, they are global, and they're still about 80% Eastern Indian and about 20% diverse. So it's definitely a group that we can learn from. Same question, you came about, about the Oh, well, I'm not much into the uh, um, entrepreneurship thing, because my feel is more about uh, journalism mm -hmm. and, and technology and how to reach, uh, how to bring that information to the people. Right, mm -hmm. right. And so how do, you, how do you see technology changing and supporting uh, Latinos in that evolution? Well, I wouldn't say just Latinos, because I, I remember uh, back in 1987, mm -hmm. the first time I got to see uh, a computer, a room full of computers, it was in Tampa when my daughter was working for Citibank or Citicorp. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, this is a room full of computers. That's interesting. OK, I see a whole bunch of characters. I don't see any graphical unit interface. OK, what can I do with this? And, and of course, just text. And so I was thinking, oh, this is something interesting to you. And years later, I found out, or that same year, I found out, What's a, what else can I do with a computer? I had no idea of the internet back then. But I did get to see something called Telnet in uh, the Sony bulletin board back then. Yeah. So that was kind of important. What can I do with it? I was like, how do the knowledge you want to uh, uh, grow in the next year? And because uh, I was only you know, like a kid, 12, 13 back then, and all I was thinking about were video games back then. And, how I, and I was thinking, OK, all, uh, all these characters are cool and awesome. And so they just have been thinking, uh, and I even asked in one panel uh, here at Hispanics like last year, where are the Latino gaming characters? Where are we in the technology? That's a good question. I don't know. Uh, I'm not in the gaming space. Everyone, uh, everyone, Coco Yo. Okay. Coco Yo, yeah, it's a popular Spanish character that's now in educational mm. Yeah, that's mm. the only one I have. <laughs> okay. It's not enough. Just one. Yeah, and, but I think Microsoft and Capcom gave me the answer last um, November for the launch of the Xbox One because they released a game called uh, Dead Rising 3. And the main character is a uh, Latino. Uh -huh. So I guess I, the chance I could have, but I would like to see more Latinos, not just as characters, but also more participating in the technology field, working when it comes to developing okay, video games, or maybe. In, in many other fields, like I, I've met a few people, a few Latinos at NASA, because I've been going to NASA for Kennedy Space Center. Right. Uh -huh. right. And, and I see the lack of Latinos in that field. And also, uh, I think we need to connect the people who are already in the in business in any of the Latino technology fields. We need to connect them and, and maybe to become uh, one big group. So that's, that's something that I would like to do. Me, Latino from different technology fields, not just in the IT field, not right. just in the electronic technology field, but in many other fields. Okay, okay. No, that's very important work, and that, that gets back to Giovanni's point about collaboration, right, and maximizing the value that we can together, and so that we're not reinventing the wheel, uh, but also showing a stronger uh, force and commitment to, uh, especially youth. Right. Mary? Yes, I think um, one important uh, key issue happened last year was the launch of Na Manos Accelerator. It was the first uh, accelerator uh, focused on Latino startups in Silicon Valley. And I think that was great uh, because it came out, it was very notorious, the need for something like that. They have like a huge success, I don't know, like a more than 70 startups applied for and, and now they, they've launched the, the second cohort, which means that Google is interested, that there's in, uh, an interest in, in, in this type of um, 
uh, startups. And I think also Latino Startup Alliance, I discovered recently that this group started as a meetup and it's starting to you know, aggregate all the Latinos and, and entrepreneurs in, in Silicon Valley. Looking for that, looking for mentorship, looking for networking. Because you have seen um, in, in Silicon Valley some success stories of uh, Latino entrepreneurs, but people that went to Stanford, for example, they have like a strong network. But what happened when you're not from uh, you know, Stanford or you are not uh, even from the United States? Where do you go? Where do you find? people like you that have the same um, problems that you have, that are working in the same, pro uh, kind of like the same project, that can collaborate and help you. You go to the type, this type of groups, uh, you apply for manners, you go to Latino Startup Alliance because you see people that are sharing with you a passion and also a challenge. I take a different approach to all this because we're at the end of the road for Latinos to take advantage in this tech opportunity that we have in front of us. If we don't do something in the next three years, for the next 25 years, we are gonna be broke. For the reason why? Because we're using and buying the devices so much, for, and the cost, of, of the cost of the services are going up. And so we don't, if we don't begin to take ownership from even just apps, or even in social media, there is no Latino viral video as of yet. You know and yet we're the most over-indexed on the phone, taking a lot of selfies, and there's nothing wrong with that. Because there's nothing wrong with having fun, but there comes a point in time where we have to take the next step, and us as entrepreneurs have to begin to say, how do we begin to monetize it? And as we look at Snapchat, look at Line, and look at live streaming, we're, not, we're just consuming it and not thinking of, where's my channel? Where's my content? So as, as they mentioned before, this is the opportunity of a lifetime that will close shortly. Why? Because corporate America has big pockets and they go to the cheapest vendor. And the cheapest vendor right now is the Philippines. Why? Because they speak Spanish. But they're not Mexican. They're not South American. Not South, they don't reflect your values. They just speak the language. So those are the challenges that we have to begin to see because the big, bigger picture is People will always go to a vendor that pays you cheaper. And it doesn't matter if you're a hard worker, because hard work is no longer valid in the United States. All the manufacturing jobs are gone. So the challenge now is to look at where you're at and begin with your passion at that level. If you're the blogger, all right, take the next step. Don't just be the best blogger in the blogging world, in the Instagram world, because we don't have breakout bloggers, or Instagrammers, or Pinterest, or tweeters. And the only ones you know, they're here. And that's great to meet each other every year. So that's the challenge. I challenge you to begin to think in those terms and say, let's look at it from a bigger picture to monetize what we have now because we all have the same devices. Bill Gates uses the same smartphone. You do the same graphics uh, on every PC or laptop. So there's no, there's no difference in technology. Now it's a question of what is our input? Is it gonna be consuming it and paying <coughs> higher prices down the road? Or are we going to be masters of our destiny? Yeah, I think as my uh, co-founder and business partner would say, you know, let's be creators and not just consumers of this technology. This is a good question. I have a question. I mean, to the point, you made a point about outsourcing technology. I think, what, I have a company that makes, develops software for other companies. And the challenge that we are facing is that we can't find good programs, right? I mean, it's not just about outsourcing it's about finding the skill set here. Um, I want to hire everybody, Latinos, but I don't find people that are smart or that have the skills to be able to do the things that I need to do for a particular client. So well, that's the, and that's the challenge now because, we, like you said, we haven't been collaborators. We think as Latinos, we have to do it all ourselves. And we're finding that now we have to share the resources. Microsoft was started with three different guys. Bill was a visionary. Paul Allen had the money, and Steve Ballmer was the administrator. When Bill left the company and Steve became administrator, Google went up, Microsoft went down. Why? Because it was a collaborative effort. We get that, but I think, I think we still have to, to you know, talk about the, the, the lack of skill set to be able to implement this technology. Look, I did the Hispanic Scholarship Fund website, the new one, then we're actually building a new application. And out there, I am looking 
for Hispanic, you know, web developers. <coughs> you can who can fit in that whole, you know, company, but you can't. You can't find it. I mean, if you find something, they already got a job. See, so so we have to solve that issue of training and be able to, to have the skill set to be able to, to develop these technologies that you're talking about. Right, there, there's certainly a pipeline issue. Yeah, and that's is. across it's the board. And across the board, it's yeah. 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 And he's not only a developer, he is lawyers that knows IP, the exactly. yeah. whole, but that's, the, the, you, you, make, you mentioned before that the Silicon Valley is, is actually a cluster of all these talents in right. one region, not precisely very Latin, it's, it's yeah. just a cluster, yeah, a uh, cluster. But do we have that cluster here in Miami? No. We have that cluster in Costa Rica, maybe a little bit, not much. So that is that cluster is missing in, 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 in Latin America on somewhere a Latino place that we could have those talents. It's missing in New York. It's missing. Right. In New York. Yeah, I wonder if I could uh, comment on that. I, uh, we were talking about challenges, right? So one big challenge is that we were, you know. Lack of a better word, we're not co-op. Okay, we, we have culturally. I think there are reasons for that, by the way. You know, what is Hispanic is somebody who carries the oppressor and the oppressed inside of them. No wonder we don't trust each other. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> right? Okay, that's a big one. But you know, very similar uh, to that is that we're not visible to one another. Um, I worked at Deloitte Consulting for a little while, and it was six months into the job where I discovered that the CEO of my company was a Puerto Rican from the Bronx. <laughs> and I was shocked, I was shocked. We hide from one another. We don't even know where the talent is. Uh, but there are some things that are becoming visible. We really start to understand where there are pockets of excellence, where there are real bright spots. Things start to happen. So I have a couple of friends who have companies in Silicon Valley that have actually learned to find software development talent in Argentina. Right, so now there is this network of Silicon Valley innovators and Argentinian developers that are actually starting to create stuff. And by the way, it's not a secret anymore. He tells all his friends, right? So that's one <coughs> one way that uh, you know making things visible can make things happen. But here's a here's another uh, another example. Um, Puerto Rico has a really big crisis. Everyone understands that, right? Yeah. Uh, there are pockets of entrepreneurs actually just trying to find a better way to survive in Puerto Rico and not do what everyone else is doing, which is leaving, right? You know, mass exodus. And by the way, Florida is the big beneficiary of all you know, the Puerto Rican exodus. Thank you. Right? <laughs> uh, and it's great, but big problem for the island. Now, here's something really interesting. Puerto Rico produces all these amazing engineers and hardware. Hardware engineering, University of Mayaguez. Guess what? There are no hardware jobs in Puerto Rico. So the only path for these guys is to just you know start up you know their own companies in hardware. But that's a visibility problem. People don't even understand that. Once we start to know each other a little bit better, we can connect the dots, and then we got to tackle the biggest problem, which is getting along, right? <laughs> <laughs> we have a question back. Here. Let's see each other first, right? Let's get this one. Yeah. Can I add to that? To that, I'm from Puerto Rico. For me, I'm not so much, I'm not techie, so I guess I'm not yeah. the IT, but I'm a social media manager, so I do digital every day. I need content managers, community managers, people who know how to do Facebook ads, not just post on Facebook. Mm -hmm. And what I've been doing is literally going to classes to talk to the kids about it. If, if the industry is not putting out there what the industry is about, it's kind of hard for the professors who are in academia to mm -hmm. get on board with an industry that's ever changing. So it's, I, I see that it's up to us to go to the schools and sometimes go get the kids. Yeah, yeah, I definitely agree. Mary? Yes, I wanted to add. Uh, yeah, I agree with you, Annie. It's a problem of visibility, but I want to put you an example. Uh, there's a competition called Startup Boss. This year, Mexico came in second place. Two years ago, they won the competition. And they're competing with teams in United States, Europe, Canada. Yeah. And, and, and they just started uh, in this competition like two, two years ago, mm -hmm. and, and they're rocking it. You know what I mean? So this is, is this huge. Is the one in San Francisco? It's the one no, that ended in, 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 in San Antonio, Texas, oh, okay. South by Southwest, yeah. that they you know, started in yeah. Mexico City, and they crossed the right. border, and all this stuff. So I think that story is great, because people from Europe, people from the United States, people from Canada, they see the quality and the talent that Mexican uh, software engineers have, in, 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 in like an entrepreneurial um, you know, mindset. 
and, and, and I think examples like that is important. It's important the visibility. And the visibility in media is not only a problem for Latinos entrepreneurs. Even the white male entrepreneur complain about it. You know, like the, the press don't pay attention to them. And it's a, it's a huge thing. A lot of people don't understand what's going on in the Latino market. There's a, you know, interest. But still, you know, we are very, I don't know, like um, mysterious, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's difficult to, 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 to understand, to understand like to and to, we have you know. difficulty understanding each other. I guess we're difficult to put in a box, so that's the problem. So, because we are so, you know, so different. And, 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 and I think this is also an opportunity and also a challenge for, for entrepreneurs. Yeah, I think we prefer challenge. to be mysterious, the most interesting man. <laughs> Question. Hi, my name is Tiana. I'm also from Puerto Rico. So, putting that aside, I think that the issue of visibility might be also a one of stereotypes, because maybe the media is portraying us as this. Oh no, because you're more into immigration or they're more into poverty or they're more interested in all these other things that are there for the Latino community um, and not that much on technology or <laughs> what we are capable to do as techies or entrepreneurs or whatever it's related with with um, this topic, so that might be also yeah, I think that's, issues. Really, that's really a, a big uh, issue, and I think that you know, going back to collaboration, uh, you know, I mean, we're here because of media, right? So how do we leverage media to tell these stories, right? To create more visibility, and then work hand in hand so that you know these entrepreneurs, uh, these tech programs, these coding classes are shared amongst the distribution of different. Uh, Entities and platforms and magazines, you know, like and that and trends, right? Yeah. yeah, and so we don't see enough of it, right? It's not re being reinforced every day, every week, every month, mm -hmm. it's every once in a while. Yeah. I wanted to say something, you know, that's exactly why I started my company 12 years ago because a kid growing up in Brooklyn, every time I would see someone that looked like me in the news or in Hollywood, mm -hmm. it was usually in the negativity of aspect of things. Mind you, yeah, we do have some negativity in our community, but doesn't everyone else? Mm -hmm. But we also have positive uh, people, positive uh, you know, uh, values and inspirational people in our community that no one wants cover. So hence that's why I started this company. Now the thing I want to make a comment because I, I, I personally comment that's a question also by the way. I, I, I um, <laughs> go figure that out. Um, <laughs> um, I, I, I um, I've been an entrepreneur all my life, basically. Um, uh, all my life, really. Um, and, um, you know, one of the things that we're all discussing, and I'm in the media business, you know, for 12 years now. One of the things that we're discussing is all these challenges and issues and, you know, what you said. But I think this way also, at the end of the day, um, look, just follow the trail or follow the money trail. And there's usually a connection to money or the lack thereof. So we as a community, as entrepreneurs, we're so new to this world called the money world. And when I say the money world, I'm talking about real money. Well, all money's real. I'm talking about you have an idea and you want to raise $100,000, that's okay. That's not really what I'm talking about. I'm talking about you have an idea and you need $2 million, $20 million, $40 million. We don't know how to do that. We're scared of that world. And, and we have to change that. And a point of reference, it's not so much change that, it's teach people a skill set that we desperately lack. Yes. Because uh, we don't know how to monetize it. We give it away for free and we become broke. And, and then we don't get respect because we give it away for free. Away they don't respect free. you. Corporate, the corporate culture does not respect you when you give it away cheap or for free. They so don't respect it. We got to start teaching children that it's okay to Instagram, it's okay to Pinterest. <laughs> and this, this last weekend in Los Angeles, a young company of teenagers started an Instagramming, Pinteresting, blogging company for your wedding. They will Pinterest blog for your wedding the whole day long. And it's amazing, you say, why would you want to do that? Because that's their reality. That's where they live. The older generation took 100 pictures, paid, paid a photographer for $5,000, and it's in a book hidden somewhere in somebody's house. No difference. So the challenge is now we've got to start looking at these, at these companies and say, how do we create a business out of it? Because that's the challenge for us now, as I see it, is that for the first time, we have a smartphone that can talk to anybody around the world. 
and we don't see it as that. We only see it as our community right now. But there are, are other people outside of our community that love our culture, that love our traditions, you know, that love our food. And we're not talking about, we're still talking within our community. So that's what, one of the things I want to reach out to you and say, look at the future. It's no longer news is breaking, news is tweeting. Okay, mm -hmm. the new TV screen is your smartphone. You got to be broadcasting to the smartphone. She's on her smartphone right now. See why? Because we're instant. Mm -hmm. And so that's where we have to begin to look at the trend as it comes and run with it. Because if you go to school for four years from now and you learn all social media, it will have changed 10 times by the time you graduate. And that's the sad reality as a lot of us old reporters, you should just do a stand up, you know, watch the news at nine. Now we're all out of a job. Because why bloggers and tweeters are telling us there was an earthquake yesterday in Chile, 8.1. As soon as it hit, 10 seconds later, I had pictures. I didn't have to wait for the news. Right. So that's the challenge in the world we live in. And once we begin to look at, from my perspective, the reality, <clears throat> is, let's run with it. And instead of saying, let's try to figure it out. Yeah. There's a question back there. I am uh, Sandra Alexander from Puerto Rico. <laughs> 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 no, 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 I think I, I, think I remember. <laughs> I'm from Nicaragua, but I, uh, I agree with what uh, uh, I said, but here's the situation also that I, I believe, you know, um, here's where the first ones are a little bit of the way that it in my head, um, which are very happy that they sent us to college. I uh, love, you know, we used to go to the bodega after school, and the man and I know, we got a college degree, thanks thank God to the bodega, and my parents. But here's the thing, cuando, <coughs> Let's say that one, I want to start un, 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 una, una, una compañía técnica. I mean, I don't have the skills. I can recognize that. You know, I'm mm -hmm. not, I, don't, I don't have the skills. I don't have the know-how. I don't know. And don't think what happens is that, but I do have the bodega mentality. The cuchillito can still me how to do this. There's nothing. So what's the solution for some of us that are like, Yes, I'm co founder. Yeah, yeah, let me, uh, let me tell you, I'm going to give you a really good example of that. Um, I recently heard about a company that's supported by Cape Town. Where's the money coming from? Really? Money's coming, okay, money's coming from a, uh, a new fund in Silicon Valley uh, started by Mitch Capor, who's uh, the found, he, he's the creator of the first killer app yeah. for the PC, Lotus123, right? Um, that's a spreadsheet, you know, later became spreadsheets, right? Uh, so Mitch, um, you know, who's actually always had an affinity for Hispanics and, and has always felt like an outsider, decided, I want to invest in Hispanics not just because I'm a good guy, but because I think it's actually a really smart business decision because Hispanics will actually know markets that nobody else knows. And markets, by the way, that could be very working class markets. Okay, so here's an example. Uh, I forget where he went, probably like Wharton or something like that, but he was not a techie guy, right? This guy who just worked really hard, got into business school, and had this idea, you know, all that money going to Mexico and little envelopes in Western Union, what if we had a tech solution for remittances? Do you know that there's more money going to Mexico through Western Union than the total foreign investment in that whole country? That's a huge business idea, and it's very practical. No tech skills this guy had. He connected with some people that did have the skills, got some support, and now he's in business. It's a company called Regali. Check them out. I check them out. Be, they're my client. Yeah. They're your client? Yeah, PR. Right on. PR. I'm going PR for them. Okay, yeah. excellent. Excellent. Yeah. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. good. Yeah, no, they're that, very that is an issue. And that is a story of, uh, of a marketplace that nobody probably would have figured out except for his staff. Yes, yes. Yeah. So how, how many funds are there available in Silicon Valley, Silicon Alley, or anywhere else in the U.S. targeted to the multicultural audience? I would, I want to answer that. And, and, and I mean, and I mean in terms of funds and also early stage seed level. Yeah. Um, I want to answer that in two ways. There are more funds that are looking at multicultural. So you look at Cape Four and you know, and there are several others, and there are angels, by the way, that are spam. A uh, guy named Manny Fernandez, I'm a bigger sponsor. He found me because I said, I'm starting a new company. This is, I follow all the Hispanics who started a new company. He found me immediately on Twitter, right? But don't limit yourself to that. Go to the whole marketplace. Educate the whole marketplace. They're starting to wake up, right? So I wouldn't say, look, you know, the only stuff that's available to me are these folks that are self-identifying as being multicultural. The whole market's ours. You know, if you have a really good uh, business idea, you will be heard. 
And well, I think obviously look, the benefit of this, this conference and where we're part of it, why it's here, a lot obviously because of your time, but also we have sponsors here. So I'm more in the investment banking field, so I'm kind of related to the raising of funds, et cetera. So what well, happened is right after this. So <laughs> I, 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 I didn't bring my chair. By, by the way, I'm human, but I love Puerto Rico. Okay, so <laughs> but the point, the point, the point that I'm getting is that. And, and I started to do this with my firm myself, but when, for example, Latino groups, organizations, et cetera, they'll say, okay, hey, can you give me $50,000? I'm with Morgan Stanley, but Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs, yeah. to help us in this and that. I think what we should do is don't give me $50,000. Give me 25% of the time of a venture capital guy that's in media and technology, mm -hmm. and assign him to these groups to go around this area and teach them where to go, what to do, and what they need to do. I think that's going to be more powerful because you're teaching someone how to fish, not giving them the fish. And I think that should apply to all of these partners that are obviously here because they want access us and say, look, it's great that you're giving us 50,000 for this conference and we're all here and I think that's very important, but let's give us talent. It gives us access to the people that really have the ability to connect to you. And, and obviously, look, not everybody's going to be successful. That's, that's life, right? But there's a lot of great uh, ideas out there that you may have but you're not a financially savvy guy. So if we can start asking more for talent of companies in the investment banking side, in the media side, in any side, I think that's gonna be more powerful. And if we can create a group that kind of harnesses that talent in a way that makes it easier for corporations, kind of put them in a, in a way that they can kind of lend them around, that would be great. I'm part of a group called the New America Alliance, which uh, is how we started really, is really, and if you access to to capital, right? Because you said, look, you need to have access to capital. So we started to do getting involved with the pension funds mm -hmm. and said, why don't you have Hispanic uh, pension managers or, or, or investment funds? They said, well, we can't find any. So what we did, we spent a year looking at the top managers that were Hispanic, and then we went to the pension fund. Here they are. So you can't tell me they're, not, they're no longer here. So that's how you basically start doing it, because I agree, the money is important, but the question is, let's ask for the right thing, right. you know, and, right. and, and so I, that's like, I just like, you see what you just said? You look for the invest, uh, investment managers, they're doing it for corporate. We need to do it for ourselves, or them, people like them, to help us do it within our community with the entrepreneurs, because that's where innovation grows, and that's our community grows, and we don't have that. I'm from New York, and I know quite a lot of people in New York, been there all my life, and I, I'm not gonna mention names, but I only have met one person, one Latino, that can raise a lot of money. That's the only one I know. There's so, no one else. That so what's your, what's your big Latino? Look, I mean, uh, without throwing names, everybody's gonna start calling them tomorrow. When I, if I were you, I'd call them too, right? Don't get me wrong, but there, there's people in LA that are, they're like the number two in one of the top equity f funds that are venture capitalists and all that. The question is having access to them, and then if you, if you give them a thousand people, they can't help you. But if you give them a way of how they can help you, they want to help you. You know. Well, we also have the largest underemployed, highly educated Latino professionals out of work. If you don't know finances, he's your new finance manager. Fifty percent of the company. Sales, you get twenty-five percent. We got to start collaborating in those essences instead of trying to do it all by ourselves. And that's, that's one of the things that's lacking with us right now is that we're not reaching out to the finance manager because that's what he does and he does it damn well good. So give him part of the business, you know, and you continue moving it forward, but you're all sharing in the same profit. And that's one of the things that we haven't taken advantage, like you said, it's talent. We have it there. I see my friends and everybody else that say, hey, you want to sell this for, uh, sell this for me? I'll give you 50%. And he goes out and sells it. Why? Because he has to feed his family. You know, he has to pay his bills. So give them incentive and they'll do it for you and they'll match you, you know, eye to eye with the same effort. And now all you have to do is, is split the efforts. Yeah, I just want to make a quick comment. So, you know, when we talk about, you know, tech being a Hispanic side, it's making that, that commitment, right? Putting the foundation in place to really change the dynamics, change the conversation so that, you know, when we think about the big brands that are here, well, that next step is, hey, let's do a hackathon around that brand that says, oh, by the way, P&G, have somebody build an app that caters to the Latino community, right? Don't have somebody else do it in Silicon Valley. Let's create that here. And so we see Sears, we see Home Depot, we see other brands in Silicon Valley having these hackathons. Well, let's have one here, right? And make that part of the conversation here and deliver on action. Uh, well, I, I can say sometimes that the uh, 
electronic entertainment aspect because I've been noticing that, for example, in Central and South America, some companies have been getting into groups and, and starting their own indie uh, uh, companies, uh, making uh, video games. And I see that some of them have, have contact with Microsoft and mm -hmm. some other companies. And I, and I am not just talking about uh, mobile apps or mobile games. I'm talking about big uh, titles uh, mm -hmm. or 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 how will you call it, like uh, AAA titles or just uh, uh, titles that are not so expensive to make. Right. So, uh, for example, I'm, I'm in contact with some people in uh, is it Peru and Chile, and even uh, some other people in Spain, and they're telling me, me look, look at me, uh, I'm making this game. I got in contact with, for example, the people in Spain got in contact with a company called uh, uh, Konami. They make some soccer games and, and they still play around the world, but they also do a smaller type of games. So I see, I, I, I just wish uh, to form some kind of group so they could inform about the set, what, what they're doing and how they did their businesses, how they succeed contacting with those big companies like right. Konami and, and even Microsoft or, or some other company. Right. That's how I wish I uh, wish we could. We could put some business together in South America because earlier we were talking about about here. How many Latinos have these skills? I mean, there are many, there are many Latinos in their country that have these skills. Mm -hmm. uh, for it could be for either IT or even something like uh, just pure programming or something is uh, specialization of graphics. Yeah, I mean, there's a visibility issue you know, as we discussed earlier. But you know, when we talk about the ecosystem, right? There's pipeline. There's education. There's, you know, the skill sets. And yeah, so because for now there's no barrier for education no. when it comes to, uh, to knowing programming and graphics and those things. Right, right. I mean, all the tools are there. All the services are there, so you can learn, right? Can but I sometimes it's also about awareness, right? Showing people that these tools and resources are available. Just so you know, the largest market that's going to grow in the next. 10 to 25 years is not the United States, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. It's Mexico, yeah. Central America, and Sur America. Mm -hmm. They are going to be the largest markets for us to invest in or to, to participate in business. Okay? Who knows the language? Who knows Portuguese? Brazilians, where are you? Argentinos. Who knows Central America, Nicaraguenses, you know, Salvadorians, Mexicanos? We know it better than anybody else. Mm -hmm. So the challenge for us is our, our parent. Our countries that our parents came from are now the target for us to do business in. So this is the opportunity of a lifetime. And if we don't take advantage of that marketplace, like I say, and build those relationships now and create those small companies, somebody else will. I would like to add what you said. Uh, you know, like instead of Latinas here in the United States, they are immediately international because they already have a connection and a link to Latin America and the huge markets that are there. You know, in Brazil and Mexico and. Some of the people that are there coming here uh, to Silicon Valley, they are from Mexico, they already validated their idea in that huge market. I mean, if you validate your idea in Mexico, I mean, you're ready to take the word. You know what I'm saying? Because it's a, it's a huge market, very uh, diverse, and, 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 and have all these complexities um, that it help you a lot uh, to, you know, to start a, a, a venture in another country, especially here in the United States. So, so can I introduce what I think is the third big problem we have? <laughs> oh, we have more? <laughs> <laughs> it has to be We tried to solve it one by one. Yeah, three is about a number than two. Okay, yeah. So, okay, we said collaboration is hard for us, right? Visibility, we're hiding from each other, right? The third problem, and I think this goes to the, you know, you, I see you're nervous, like, we got to do it now. You're right. There is a problem that we have. A lot of us feel very, very uncomfortable being the boss. A lot of us are fixed permanently in this thought that we're oppressed, that somebody else is going to take it from us, you know, that somebody else should be in charge, that we're not good enough, that we're not smart enough, that we don't have the skills, right? That is our biggest problem, and it lives inside us, right? I'm not sure how we're going to address that, but there's a really beautiful talk at uh, TEDx Mexico a few years ago, and I think it was Salinas' son. I just wanted to put it, the president's son. Uh, who uh, took the opportunity at TED to say, look, I know Mexico has all these problems. The, our biggest problem is not what you think it is. It's not crime, you know, it's not drugs, it's us. 
the biggest problem we have right now is that we're defeated. That we don't believe in ourselves. How do you address something like that? I think community, again, is the answer. Because once you start finding people you know, who actually overcame that big challenge and became a boss and started a company, what's a founder but a boss, right? It's somebody who said, you know what? I have a skill. I don't want to work for somebody. I want to create jobs, right? You know, for somebody. And that is a very, very big mental leap. It comes easier for some other cultures, I have to tell you. Uh, it's very no well known in, in, among sociologists that the Chinese have no problem with this at all. And that's why you see so many businesses that are family oriented once they come. So how, do you, how do we address that? Because that is, you hit the nail on the head, but absolutely true. 100%, I, I think, about 200%. How do we address that? I think it's things like this. You know, I'm a big believer in things like Hispanic size and Latinism and Jesse's uh, Latino startup lines, very event based. <clears throat> I believe in social engagement that is offline. That's actually my passion. Uh, because when you meet people face to face, you really get to know them, right? And you really start to understand their stories. But I think it starts here. Meet people like us. We're, okay, so we're getting more visible, right? We're starting to talk to each other. Uh, understand each other, and I think you'll become more like them. You know, it'll, it's in you, by the way. It's in everyone. Everyone wants to be free. It's like an entrepreneurial support free. group. Yeah. <laughs> everyone wants to be free. <laughs> so we can everyone wants to be free. Yeah. Yeah. We I can do it. Yeah. I'll yeah. share yeah. it. What you mentioned is right. I mean, there is no support group. So in Mexico, is growing really fast because it's not only the, the big colleges like the Tech, La UNAM, yeah, behind right. the new hackathons. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a private uh, companies like Telmex with their Telmex hubs that are basically development centers with hackathons weekly. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's basically the support group these, these kids are getting. And I know I mean, different uh, developers in Mexico that are growing really fast. Now in the US, I mean, it seems that developers that are absorbed by, by Microsoft, by Sega, by Nintendo. Yeah. I mean, but they, I mean, immediately mm -hmm. recognize the talent and they take them, but it's not in a leadership position. It's just that's good. Fun. Yeah, I will tell you, workers, there is no leadership to take the next step. Yeah. And by the way, you know, there, there actually is a type of organization that understands how to do this with Hispanics and with African Americans. They're called gangs. Okay? Gangs are leadership. You know, training yeah. is yeah. the wrong business. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> you can do a lot better than that. I, I really am glad that you brought up what I call cultural gremlins, which are the things that we think. You know, we think that this is us, that this is part of our culture, but the reality is that culture is malleable and that we can change culture. We're all culture makers here. The fact that we're having this conversation here is hugely important. And I'm glad you brought up the part of the offline <coughs> world, of us really having conversations. Because I wouldn't be sitting here if I hadn't met somebody in person. If I had just done online courses, I wouldn't be here. It's been two years in the making of me meeting Michelle Alvera at a Wilson Sonsini class and her telling me about Jesse and Ed and Latino Startup Alliance and me showing up to events and otherwise that wouldn't be possible. But I don't think that those are fixed things, that they can change. The things that do concern me that I am worried about are the, the skills gaps, you know, the, the fact that we have a horrible educational system in the United States and that we have to supplement it as parents for our kids to be able to be at the level that somebody in Denmark or China or even the Philippines has to be in. Because those this are good business global... ideas to look at. I mean, that itself, those are business. Those are business there, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry, are you saying stop? Let me add some context here. So uh, they keep up bringing, bringing up Latino Startup Alliance. So that's a, an organization that we started back in like 2011, grassroots meetup group. And over the past two years, we've grown organically. So this year, we're launching as a nonprofit. Manny's part of the leadership team. He's a co-founder. Okay. Latino Startup Alliance. And so our whole mission is to build an ecosystem that supports Latino tech entrepreneurship. And so over those two years, close to a thousand members, and you know, heavily based in the Bay Area, San Francisco. And so with that, we're all, we're expanding to Miami and New York City. And the goal is to expand to other cities across the U.S. so that we can take that knowledge from Silicon Valley and deliver it to other cities and other groups across the U.S. And so that's our commitment to Latino tech entrepreneurs. I think in addition to that, the core fundamental value of the family should be education, mathematics, science. I'm from Africa, okay? So for me, it was like, magic or you, you go home with nobody. Right. But I married a half 
Okay. <laughs> yeah. And, 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 you know, I don't like to self-promote, but, you know, we did do a uh, build a web page in a day last year in uh, May, and we had 60 young Latinas uh, show up and do a one-day workshop. And so that was sponsored by various uh, tech companies, especially Google. And because of that, you know, and also our partnership with Black Girls Code, we're going to take that initiative nationwide to 10 cities, a thousand girls, and all again because of that one pilot, and again just reaching out and ensuring that we're bringing technology to our youth and especially young Latinas. Uh, yes, I would like to ask, excuse me, about the culture and came to my mind that Latinos, when you grow up, you are the first to go to college, you know, your parents expect you to go be a doctor, be an attorney, an entrepreneur, it's kind of like, you know, that nebulous, uh, it doesn't seem like a profession exactly, so that's also a, a, a problem for a lot of Latinos, they don't see the entrepreneurial as a path, and also the culture of failure, you know, so this is something that we haven't talked, in Latin America, failure is a taboo, nobody wants to talk about the failure, you know, and here, I have seen people in Silicon Valley, who made from failure a business because they talk about their failure and they charge for that. You know what I mean? <laughs> and, 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 and so this is, like a, this is a, a way how you look at, you know what I mean? So I, I think this is two important things that we need to to really to see in, in, in the kids. It's just like a, entrepreneurial is a path, it's a valid path. You need the skills, you need to prepare yourself. Um, and at the same time, failure is not as bad mm -hmm. as we think it is. You know, it, it's, it's, it's how you fail. I mean, we're not talking here like we're gonna become all a man of failures, <laughs> but it's the idea of, you know, you fail fast, you fail cheap, and, and you try the ideas, and, 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 and then and, and you go, and, and that's how, how to be, I think, it's very So I think I wanna add to this, like, you know, no one, no, not everybody can be an African American. That's for sure. Right? So, yeah. I mean, we, we have to sort of have a culture of education is the number one thing you have. Right, so you gotta have your education the pocket to get those you you gotta suffer a little, have your education in your pocket. And then the next thing, you know, if you want to do entrepreneurship, if you have the guts for it, go for it. But the problem that I think is going on now is the fact that we do not have that as an option. You know, a lot of that, a lot of times we are sent, you know, first generation, second generation, even second generation into college to get one of those jobs. And you don't have the, the open mind of your parents, for example, to say you can be an entrepreneur. You're going out to get a better life than we did, is usually the mindset. So that's when you start having the conversations we're having right now, when you're about to be 40 years old and you realize, oh, wait a minute, I have that option. Yeah. 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 Well, they all have the option. I hear you. But, but here, I want to say something. That's not an option. I want to comment on the not everyone's talking to I agree with you. But there are a couple of things to think about. One is that on, you could be entrepreneurial in any job. That means, that means you're innovating inside the company and they're going to give you support. Right? The second thing is that uh, I do work with AARP, and I was just talking about this uh, you know, earlier with this group. Uh, when people turn 40 or 45 today, uh, they're not thinking about retirement, okay? Life has changed, we're living longer, and really what we're doing is a restart. You know what most Americans are doing? They're starting to think, oh, all that stuff I, I learned working for you know, these large companies, I can do it myself. But a lot of entrepreneurs that start from the 45, but it's a path, it's a path to freedom. It's a path to economic freedom and personal freedom. That's what we should talk about. It's a bigger, bigger conversation. It's not just talking to who attended the lunch yesterday by the educator, yesterday, the, uh, for Miami? Yeah. And I remember that I, the, I love the quote that he said, I'm American by choice, you know? Um, that was a powerful, because he's an immigrant, so he chose to be American, right? And from that, I just got something out. I'm an entrepreneur by choice, right? And that's exactly by choice. Meaning, when I started, to, to your point, when I started my business, my I was young, I was a 19-year-old kid, still living with my parents, they went crazy. No one in my family, my whole family has ever been an entrepreneur. They went crazy. They said, you okay? And, 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 you know, and, 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 and you know, they really went crazy when I hit him up for a loan. <laughs> hey, here's the person, let's get rid of that French word, mother and mother. But my point, to my point is, it's by choice. We make choices, right? And by the way, uh, they, they gave me the loan, and so did two uncles. They got, they got a 10% they got return on their money within two years. Um, I paid them back all their money ten, ten times. Not 10%, 10 times. Oh. 
Ten times you do better. It wasn't a lot of money. So it wasn't a lot of money. <laughs> okay, I think we need to wrap up. This has been a great discussion. We thank our panelists for being in the conversation.